Most people who have played D&D, even for an insignificant amount of time, will be familiar with the giants. Hill giants, fire giants, stone giants, cloud giants, and storm giants make up the cast of these huge creatures. But long ago, there existed another type of giant that sat directly below the storm giants in terms of hierarchy. They were immensely powerful, and during the age of the giants, they held domain over a huge portion of the land. However, when a threat presented itself to the ash giants, who would eventually become known as death giants, they struck a terrible bargain with a dark entity. But in exchange for this deal, which they thought would save their kin and preserve what great power they held, they ended up bringing ruin upon themselves. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig into past editions of tabletop games to find old monsters that have not seen the light of day in many years and convert them to 5th edition D&D and come up with ideas and ways that we can use them in our current campaigns. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be talking about a creature that comes to us from D&D 3.5 originally, however it has been seen in several versions of the game. And just a quick note, there is a full converted 5th edition stat block in the form of a Google document which you can find in the description right below this video, so feel free to follow along if you want or just check it out at the end. But in any case, we're going to talk about exactly what these guys can do in combat and of course some plot hooks and ways that we can use them in our game. But before we get to that, we need to understand what a death giant actually is. As their name would suggest, they are obviously giants. They are completely isolated from the rest of giant society due to the fact that they collectively made a pact with a dark entity, literally selling the souls of their entire race in exchange for power. And that power allows them some sway over mortal souls, as well as the ability to cast a lot of magic, most of it of course being linked to the negative energy plane, which in 5th edition we would simply refer to as the Shadowfell. And of course they're also capable of using weapons the size of telephone poles. And while many giants are quite similar in terms of what they can do, these guys have a very unique spin that they put on combat because of their magical powers. And that, combined with their extremely interesting backstory, makes them very viable monsters, and I can't wait to use these guys in my own game. But before I get ahead of myself, we're going to take a look and see just exactly what they can do in... So Death Giants fall just below Storm Giants in the Ordning, which is kind of the pecking order of all of the giant races. However, they have long since abandoned the concept of the Ordning and even really falling in line with their other giant kin, they are kind of separated and do their own thing. And while they may have once been a peg below the Storm Giants, they are now much more powerful. Physically, their capabilities are very similar to that of Storm Giants. They're, they're just as strong, maybe a little bit more cunning, and definitely a lot wiser in the ways of magic. So of course, up close and personal with a giant is not where you want to be, and Death Giants are no exception. They deal out tremendous amounts of damage with their two-handed great axes, and if you're at a distance, they can always throw rocks at you. However, what makes a Death Giant truly terrifying, and also where their name comes from, is the fact that they have the ability to steal souls. See, Death Giants are constantly surrounded by this protective aura, this miasma of all the souls that they've stolen over their incredibly long lives. Because whenever they kill a creature, that creature's soul becomes bonded to the Death Giant. And that Death Giant can then use its magic to force that soul to protect it and act as a sort of spectral guardian. So because of this, the souls will warn the giant of any impending danger and gives them advantage on initiative rolls and perception checks. Not an extremely powerful ability, but it's definitely going to help here and there. However, the giant can also command all the souls in its possession to wail in this extremely terrible keening. Just a massive wall of sound comprised out of the screams of the damned. And if it does so, all creatures within a hundred feet of the giant will have to make a wisdom saving throw. And anyone who fails that save is frightened. This is horrible when you're at such a far range because it means you can't move closer to the target of your fear, which in this case is the giant. And the only way for this fear to be shaken off is to either move outside the 100 foot area, so run away until you can't really hear it anymore and then move back in, or you have to make the screaming stop, either by killing the giant 
or making it so that you can't hear it in one way or another. And this is kind of one of the things I like about this creature is because that creates a bit of an opportunity for your players. It could be a really powerful use of the silence spell. If you were to cast a zone of silence on top of the giant, the sound wouldn't be happening. So suddenly you're not frightened anymore. And honestly, if a player told me they wanted to stuff their ears full of cotton or whatever random scraps of clothing they had around, I would totally allow that too. As long as you're not hearing it full on, you're not really going to be affected. So it's kind of a bit of a puzzle for your players to solve if they can think of that in the heat of combat. The other major threat that the Death Giants have up their sleeve is magic. Most Giants can cast a spell or two, and usually they're nothing crazy. However, the Death Giant has some seriously powerful spells up its sleeve. For example, once per day it can cast Flame Strike, except instead of causing radiant damage, it causes fire and necrotic damage. That can be a devastating spell for an entire party if they're all bunched together. It can also cast Dispel at 5th level, which is going to potentially ruin some buffs or other magical effects the party might have on them. And of course, amongst a few other minor spells, it can cast Spirit Guardians. Spirit Guardians is a terrifying spell, as many clerics will tell you. Essentially what it does is it creates an aura of floating spirits that surround you, and any creature that ends its turn within that aura or enters that aura for the first time on its turn takes a bunch of damage. This is already pretty scary if a cleric is using it, but when a creature that is as martially adept as a death giant is using this kind of spell, it can become terrifying. Because not only are you dealing with the threat of the giant, you also have this tremendous amount of damage affecting everyone around it. And I should also mention that as part of this kind of soul stealing ability, if a creature has 10 or fewer hit points and it's within 15 feet of the giant, it has to make constitution saves at the start of each of its turns or else it just dies. And this is scary for a few reasons. For one, it just essentially knocks 10 hit points off your hit point maximum potentially. So even if you're weak but still up, you could still die just from being close to this thing. This means that if you have a party member go down, just giving them one point of health isn't going to be enough. They're going to be making saves to not have their soul be ripped out of their body. The second reason this is really scary is that say someone goes down, they're not dead yet, but they're unconscious and they're making death saving throws. Not only are they going to have to make their death save, but after that, they're also going to have to make another constitution save to not just automatically die. And it's a high save. And if a creature does die when it's within 15 feet of a death giant, its soul is removed from its body so it is permanently dead. That creature cannot be brought back to life while that giant still has possession of its soul. And in order to make sure the giant no longer has possession of a creature's soul, the giant either has to be killed or you have to somehow convince that giant to relinquish that specific soul, which it is capable of doing. And in a lot of cases, if the giant has maybe taken down a party member or two, but feels like the fight isn't on its side, it might stop and bargain and say, look, I'll give you back the souls of your two deceased friends if you just let me go. Essentially calling it truce. The other thing to keep in mind here too is that if two death giants are fighting in the same battle and one of them dies while it's within proximity of the other death giant, all the souls that belong to that giant along with that giant soul itself will then be transferred to the other death giant. And this is why, at least I imagine, death giants often have a huge miasma of souls with them. Not only do they have the souls of every enemy they've claimed, but if a death giant knew it was going to die, rather than having its soul along with all the other souls it's collected passed on to their fiendish patron, it would instead choose to die in the presence of maybe a relative, possibly one of its children, and pass all of those souls along with its own soul onto its child. So because of this, you could literally have death giants with souls collected not only by themselves, but eight or nine generations of their forefathers all passed down throughout the ages. Thus, of course, making each generation of death giants even stronger than the last. The only way these souls will ever be released is if the death giant is killed, or for some reason decides to release them and there's not another death giant within proximity to claim them. In any case, that pretty much sums up what these guys can do in battle. They are absolutely terrifying, but what really makes them fascinating to me and why I wanted to do this conversion in the first place was because of their backstory and the lore implications of including death giants in your world. So let's take a look at some. 
So as I mentioned before, Death Giants essentially made what we would consider in 5th edition a warlock pact with some kind of ancient evil, except it wasn't just one individual Death Giant. They literally swore away the souls of their entire race, all that existed and all that were yet to be born. So Death Giants that are alive now are living with the mistakes of their ancestors, kind of playing into this bargain that they had no choice in. One kind of interesting side effect of this was that the giant gods who the Death Giants at one point when they would have been known as Ash Giants along with all other giants revered completely abandoned the Death Giants when they made this pact. They essentially said, oh, you don't want to worship us anymore. You're going to rely on this other being for power. Great. Have fun being forsaken. So because of this, Death Giants might not necessarily behave in the way that you would expect some giants to because they don't really follow the same gods or tenets. However, there absolutely would be those among Death Giants who still follow the old ways. And even though they know that they've been kind of banished from their god's sight, they still follow those ways just out of respect and out of an appreciation for what their culture was before they fell. This bit of lore alone opens up so many plot hooks because we don't know why the Death Giants fell or what entity they became bonded to, but maybe you have an existing evil entity in your game that you want to give some sort of minions to. Perhaps this entity has promised the Death Giants in your world that, hey, if you exact my bidding and help me in this war or whatever it is, I will remove the curse from you and no longer lay claim to your souls. That would be great motivation for an entire race of people who have essentially been damned. On the flip side of that, maybe this evil entity is the bad guy of your campaign and your players are actively trying to stop them in whatever they're doing, and they end up finding an unlikely ally in the Death Giants. While they practice soul-stealing magic and all kinds of other horrendous things, perhaps they have the same enemy. And if the Death Giants find out your players are trying to stop whoever this entity is, they might align themselves with the party in an effort to destroy this thing and ultimately remove the curse from their people. Or you could totally use that as the framing device of an entire campaign, where you have your party trying to help the Death Giants in destroying this entity, or at the very least releasing them from their shackles. Because maybe they wouldn't be such a bitter and evil society if they A, didn't have the ability to practice this horrible magic, and also didn't think that they were completely condemned from birth. Another thing I find really interesting about Death Giants is that while they have much command over death and such related powers, their death is ultimately something that they fear. Because unlike many races that have deities and other outside powerful entities watching over them, Death Giants have no illusions about what happens to them after they die. There's a recurring theme within Death Giant society that no Death Giant has ever successfully been brought back to life through use of a resurrection spell or anything like that. And this leads them to believe that after they die, their souls are destroyed. Now whether this is true or not, is kind of up in the air. That ultimately falls on you as a DM and how you want to include them in your world. It is possible that maybe their patron doesn't destroy their souls, but uses them for something that prevents them from being resurrected. And maybe that process ultimately does destroy them, who's to say, but that's for you to decide. So because of this, they will almost never fight to the death. If they feel their death is incoming and there's no other death giant around to gather their souls up, because of this fear they have, they will do pretty much whatever it takes to survive. Whether that's stopping their assault to bargain, come up with some kind of truce, or resorting to extremely underhanded methods in combat, whatever the case is, they do not want to die. Not that anyone wants to die, but they really don't want to die. This dark bargain and its impact on the Death Giants is completely all-encompassing of their identity. It is who they are and it's what they deal with from the first day that they are born. So all-consuming is this desire to be free that if they even get an inkling of a possibility that they could set themselves free by gaining some sort of magical item or invoking some sort of magical rite, they will do nothing but focus on that objective and try to achieve it. You could absolutely set them up as a villainous group of individuals where maybe some town or city has a rumor spreading about an ancient object of power hidden within and the Death Giants think for one reason or another that they can get that item and use it to free themselves. 
They would lay siege to that city and destroy absolutely everything in their way until they got what they were looking for. And it's possible that this object isn't even going to help them. Maybe they had this rumor whispered in their ear by someone with an even darker purpose who was simply using them as a tool to destroy a kingdom or a village or a town or a city or whatever the situation is. And perhaps once they defeat the death giants, your party realizes that they weren't even the threat. They were simply a tool being used by a puppet master. Or if your party's able to figure that out before it's too late, perhaps they can sway the death giants to side with them and destroy their would-be puppeteer. But however you choose to spin these guys, I think death giants are extremely fascinating and I love the idea of a member of the giant community who is kind of excommunicated for a grave sin. A literal case of the sins of their fathers coming back to bite them in the ass. So if you like this monster and you want to use it in your game, as I said, there is a stat block in the description below. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can get the monster manual style 5th edition stat block all done up with the artwork and everything on my Patreon. And if you do like what I do here and you want to support the channel, uh, subscribing is obviously the easiest way to do that. But if you want to take that to another level, please check out my Patreon. There's a bunch of neat stuff over there. And while you're down looking in the description below, you can see links to my Twitter, Discord, if you want to chat, all that kind of stuff. Discord and Twitter are probably the best places to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions for creatures you'd like to see on upcoming Monster of the Week episodes, or if you simply have ideas and plot hooks and ways you'd like to use this creature and you want to discuss that with our community, that is the place to do it, as well as the comments below. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I can't wait to see what interesting ideas and ways you come up with for using these new types of giants. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Till then.